Hello again, welcome back. Uh, this week we are looking in this first lecture about building uh, numeracy across the mathematics curriculum. So we'll talk a little bit about what numeracy is and um, how it's different from mathematics and these are some of the ideas you'll also pick up in your tutorial. Uh, here's a brief overview. Uh, we'll talk about what numeracy is and what it's about. Um, you'll hear a lot about numeracy and often people just assume it's the same as mathematics. Uh, and then we'll try and talk about how we can build numeracy in across the curriculum and the things we do. Um, I think as you see some of these ideas, you'll um, see that they resonate with the things we've talked about previously. And again, as we go through here, we're talking about some ideas and things that are imbued in the curriculum, not just in Queensland, but across Australia and other parts of the world. But also things that will help you inform um, your ideas and your practices as a teacher. So when you go out in schools, you need to determine how you're going to teach mathematics and numeracy and what part these things have in it. So what numeracy isn't? Um, some people think that numeracy is about numbers, doing sums, arithmetic and things like that. Um, some people think numeracy is something that's just done in the primary school. Um, and some use it as a name just for the most basic maths you can do in secondary school. Or some, a lot of people actually think it's just mathematics by another name. So they'll say numeracy or mathematics as if they're synonymous. Now, at least how it's defined in curriculum documents across Australia, numeracy is seen as something different from um, mathematics. Obviously related. Um, but the, the most common thing is when people ask about numeracy, I think it's sort of like the calculation part of mathematics or the number strand. So can you do your times tables? Can you do addition and subtraction? Can you do it uh, in your head or with a pencil and paper? That sort of stuff. Um, people think if you use a calculator it's because you're lazy or you're incompetent uh, and that technology is not really seen as having a place in it. Now, all, all of these things are not correct, at least has as it's been defined now in the Australian education system. It's not just the basics. But what numeracy is, um, is a broader understanding about how mathematics can be uh, used, I suppose. Uh, it's about mathematical thinking and is a way of um, being practical with mathematics. So it's foundation and it's related to mathematics, but it's not the same. <clears throat> and the curriculum will tell you that numeracy, like literacy, is the responsibility of all teachers in all parts of your curriculum. So you can be doing numeracy when you're teaching science or something else as well. And in the same vein, you should be teaching some parts of literacy and, and mathematical literacy, but literacy generally when you're teaching mathematics. So, uh, this is a, the idea of numeracy is something that's been picked up probably over the last 10 or 15 years um, and not just in Australia. So if you click on that YouTube link, you'll see a video uh, from the United Kingdom about what numeracy is. Um, I hope the links are working. Um, I've been checking them, so let's hope in the transition, transition to a PDF they don't get lost. But in Australia, numeracy is one of the seven general capabilities, and I'm sure you're familiar with the general capabilities from all your um, general education courses you've done right across the first years of this, this program. And, and these general capabilities, including numeracy, have to be developed and used across all early learning areas and in co-curricular programs and in their lives outside of school. So someone who's numerate is someone who can use mathematics and uh, in, in school, in maths, but in other subjects, in co-curricular things, and also in their life beyond the school fence. Uh, and here's a definition that's taken from uh, ACARA, the general capabilities, word for word there, numeracy involves students recognising and understanding the role of mathematics in the world and having dispositions and capacities to use mathematical knowledge and skills purposefully. So you can see there it's more than just being able to do arithmetic and number skills. Uh, certainly there's some the, the skills to be able to use it and the knowledge to be able to use it, but also it's the disposition and the capacities. 
So part of being numerate would also be um, if you approach a situation outside of school, for example, where it would be appropriate to use some mathematical knowledge that you're willing and have the disposition to use it. So that's a broad uh, definition of numeracy and that's the one that's adopted by ACARA. Uh, and at this stage, that's the definition that should drive your practice in schools in Queensland. Now there's been a range of um, reports and commissions and research around numeracy uh, in different parts of the world and, and a lot of it's been driven by the fact that they want adults to actually be capable of doing uh, being numerate and being able to use mathematics in their everyday lives. And so there's a different another definition there it's, it's the ability to access and interpret and communicate mathematical information and ideas so you can engage in mathematical demands of a range of situations. Uh, it's about solving problems in real context. So it's not so much can you work out the um, dimensions of a piece of wood in a textbook in grade five, but it's more as if you were building a deck or something at home, could you calculate how much timber you needed to do that job, if that makes sense. It's the practical application of it. And, and what it's saying very clearly is it's more than just having knowledge and skills. You have to have the disposition to use it. And some of the times at school, while we teach them all the knowledge and skills, we also teach them not to have the disposition to use it. So what are some of the qualities of someone who displays numerate behaviour, or someone who is numerate? Um, well, it involves a lot of reasoning and problem solving skills. Uh, when you give the measurement problem in your textbook, it's all very clean and nice and everything's exact. But as you will know from things you've done outside of school, when you do measuring, whether it's building something or making something or cooking something or, or whatever it is, the measurements are never that exact and precise. Uh, it also involves literacy skills, being able to read and make sense of things. It also involves, as we mentioned there, the dispositions to do it. And the things that can uh, lead to that are based on your private experiences and practices. Certainly we know that some people who do very poorly in mathematics at school are actually very numerate in their particular context. I remember meeting a plumber who, who did no maths at school that he can remember of being any significance, never passed anything, but he could very quickly work out um, the rise, uh, the fall for uh, running a pipe to get the um, water to run the right direction. So he's very numerate in that context even though he wasn't particularly strong in the mathematics. So that's what it means to be numerate. And here's an example of what it might look like. In numeracy, we start with some sort of real problem as opposed to a made up problem we might get in a textbook in the classroom. Uh, and I know real is a loaded term there because even if it's a textbook at school, it's still real at that time. But a, a real problem, something that relates to people's lives um, beyond just schooling. Now from that, the real problem, you do some sort of modelling and then you'll turn it into a mathematical problem. So if you wanted to find out how much fertiliser you might need for a garden bed, well the first thing you do is then model it by measuring the garden bed and perhaps drawing a diagram and putting some measurements on it. So that would be modelling it to make it into a mathematical problem. You then use your procedural knowledge to find a mathematical solution. So you, if it was a rectangle, you'd use your mathematical knowledge about area being the length times the width and therefore you'd find a mathematical solution to the area of this garden bed and then from there you would translate that back to the real solution. So you might say okay the area is this much and therefore uh, this is how much fertiliser you might need. And then after you've done that you would check it against the real problem to see if it makes sense. So in a simplified version this could be a way of understanding numeracy. But the interesting thing at school is what do we do is we spend um, most of our time just doing this part here. Now just because someone is good at solving mathematical problems with procedural knowledge and skills to get a mathematical solution doesn't mean they're numerate. We need them to be doing all the other things as well. And in fact nowadays we know that with technology the part we've got, the, the red uh, oval around there, is probably the easiest part. Back in the olden days, 
it was more important because we didn't have calculators and computers and things that could work out the um, math actual calculations. But nowadays, this, this can be done fairly easily by a range of uh, technology and applications. But the hard part is trying to turn this so-called real problem into a math problem so it can then be solved and then translating it back. So in doing numeracy at school, these are some of the things the kids should be doing in problems that are real and meaningful to them. So some of the issues and challenges that have faced um, schools and education systems as they've tried to promote numeracy have been uh, are listed here. The first one is understanding what numeracy is and, in, and getting them to be enacted. Most of the time in school systems for a long time we've just said numeracy is about mathematical skills and we just do the things that were on the uh, side of that diagram we showed previously. Uh, the other problem we've had is we've taught people the skills and the uh, knowledge, but we've in the process we've given them dispositions which actively work ag against being numerate. So students don't engage or are not inspired, they're disengaged and, and they're um, not willing to engage in things. So even when they come to places that require numeracy uh, and they may have the knowledge and the skills, they're not inclined to use it because their dispositions have been turned off. And usually they've learnt this at school. Um, another issue that we faced in school systems is that numeracy is everybody's business. And given that you're going to be primary school teachers, what this means is numeracy isn't just something you do in maths, you do it across all your subjects. So here's an important pathway, some ways of thinking of it. And again, these are ideas, these are not recipes of how do you, you could do it, but just things to think about. If someone's going to become numerate through problem solving, they need <coughs> to develop capacity to use the application of mathematical concepts and skills. Not just learn the mathematical concepts and skills, but be able to use them. And this is something we actually have to teach them. It's not something that they will just automatically do if we teach them these concepts and skills. <coughs> we need to relate these skills to a social function, to things they're doing outside of schools, their work, their world beyond the classroom and how they might see this an integral part of their lives. And we also need to help students to have the ability to critically analyse mathematical information to make informed judgments. So for example, <coughs> if a student looks at a um, graph in the newspaper or a graph depending on what state you're from, um, can they look at it and, and critically analyse it to see if it's reasonable or, or has it been skewed to try and and make the information look different than what it actually is. So having a, the ability to critically analyse things is important and being numerate is certainly part of that. Now the other thing that's important is, is the context and language. And again, you will know this from all your education stuff you've done over the last couple of years. But in this case, problem solving is in fact mathematics in a context. Not just any context, but a context that is meaningful and makes sense to the students because the context helps to decide what steps you need to take and how to imply the mathematics involved. Uh, the context will help you determine if it's appropriate to do something a certain way. So uh, an example might be if there was a, you were trying to work out how far apart two ships were on the ocean. Now, a student could know the um, mathematics involved, they could not have the skills involved that they've learned in class, but then they need to work out from the context what's a reasonable answer. So they could work out the answer, but then what would be a reasonable way of reporting that answer? If these ships are kilometres are apart on the ocean, it wouldn't make sense to report them as being to the nearest millimetre apart. That would, the context would say you need to report them in something that's reasonable given the context of the question. So the context helps determine things. It's not just an extra thing, it's actually part of it. Uh, I think I've told you earlier about a, a famous um, question about uh, they gave to students about buying chocolate bars and they said uh, it was a written word question in a test and it said if, if Mars bars cost $1.67 how many Mars bars could we get for $5? Now a lot of kids realise that that's just a division problem, it has nothing to do with Mars bars at all and they just did five um, dollars divided by $1.67 and got the answer of three. But what happened was that a lot of kids who took the context seriously said things like, 
Oh, well, we know at Coles this week that Mars bars are on special for a dollar. So the answer is five. So you see how having an understanding of the context changed the nature of the question. Um, and again, the language is important here. Again, you'll be familiar with the language and, and how the language can shape something. But having a language that's meaningful and makes sense to the kids is important to help them be able to comprehend what they're talking about. And often what we do is we replace everyday language with mathematical language. Um, so for example, the term mean and average, in everyday language we often talk about average and we wouldn't talk about a mean. But in, in uh, mathematical language, the average is, uh, could mean one of three things, the mean, the median or the mode. So depending on the language being used, you'll need to work out what the actual mathematical language is you're trying to find out <coughs> because the language makes a difference. And again, trying to get the language to help the children see and understand the mathematics. Um, it's, not, it's not enough just to speak in their everyday language, but you also need to help them bridge towards the mathematical terms. So here's just an example. A popular group concert charges $12 for children 12 years and younger. Obviously they're not that popular if they're only charging $12. The Rose Garden offers special rate for groups. Admission under this special rate is $40 for four children, $49 for five children, $57 blah blah blah. How much money will it cost for a group of eight? Okay, so that's a problem, something that have to involve more than just applying a routine algorithm or procedure. Whereas the second one is just a, a routine problem, it's not a problem solving thing, it's, it's just a calculation. If I work for 15 hours at $18 per hour, how much will I earn? So this is just one example to try and show you the difference between the two. All right. Um, now what became popular well, quite a while ago now, but still has some um, popularity and um, use I've seen in schools is the use of particular problem solving methods and uh, procedures. And again, there's a couple of YouTube there you can look at. But for students, often we used to teach them these one at a time and give them a problem that required each one. And then we had a poster on the board which listed them and we got them to try and work out. Now in a sense what we did was we turned problem solving into an algorithm, choose the correct procedure and apply it. And it's not meant to be like that, but it should be like a tool of uh, ways, a tool, set of tools that students can use to tackle problems. And, and some of these would be guess and check, um, make a table, act it out, work backwards, draw a diagram, make a model, solve a similar or simpler problem. And, and there's lots of examples of these and you can find them, there's some YouTube clips there, but you'll find heaps of them uh, on the web if you just look for them. But they're just a set of tools that help students um, solve problems. And we've got to be careful we don't teach them as in the same way we'd teach them a standard algorithm for solving something. Um, and part of it is the students knowing, well, given this problem, what would be an appropriate one of these tools to use to try and help solve it? And often you might need a, a more than one. Also, there's some teaching strategies that would help you with kids learning problem solving to be more numerate. Um, providing good examples, uh, and when by good examples we mean problems that are of interest to the students. So if you've got a primary school group of kids, um, they're likely to be interested in the Commonwealth Games or the Olympic Games or other sporting things. They're likely to be interested in events that affect them in their lives around them. They may be interested in stories and movies or stuff like that. There's a whole pile of things that are of interest to them. And as primary school teachers, you, you'll be well aware of these things. And so if you can, try and connect in meaningful ways to that, uh, rather than to things that they might not be interested at all, even though that would be a real context. For example, mortgages when they're doing percentages or something like that. Um, model it, model um, similar problems, model how you might solve it. Now when you solve a problem in front of students, what happens is you write down something and then you do the thinking in your head and then you write something else down. And the part that the children need access to is the thinking that's gone on in your head. So if you can, and sometimes it feels a bit awkward, try and talk out loud what's going on in your head as you solve it. 
what you're thinking, what are the questions you're going through. Say it out loud so the students have access to your um, thinking as you go. Um, problem solving, allowing students to talk. Having a quiet classroom doesn't always um, help students when they're doing problem solving. Uh, sometimes, of course, it's appropriate, but sometimes they need to talk and nut things out and share ideas, compare, try and explain it to each other and see what they've got. Um, sometimes you need to encourage them to reflect on what they've done. So they might tell you something and you might repeat it back to see if that's what they meant, those sorts of things. All those good questioning techniques, which again, you should have learned in your other courses and you will develop a whole repertoire of, which we hope will just become almost like automatic practice as you develop in your teaching career. Um, always asking, is there a better way to find the answer? Is there another way to find the answer? Or when students give you an answer, you might ask them, are you sure? To make sure they go and reason about it. Now, the interesting thing about that is we often ask, are you sure when they've got it wrong? But sometimes I would ask them, are you sure if they've got it right? Just to make sure that they can justify what they've done. So, a report was done in Canada about what a mathematically literate student might look like. And here's some of the things you would hope to see. Not as a checklist, but as a teacher, these are some things that I would try and look for in my students as they're doing a problem solving after I've tried to teach and help them develop these things. So they're trying to make sense of mathematics. Are they developing deep and flexible uh, capacity to do their mathematical thinking? Do they make connections with different things? Um, do they have a sense of numbers and their size and how they can be used? Uh, do they persevere or do they just give up pretty quickly? Because incidentally, if they give up pretty quickly, it's normally because the way we've structured our learning things has been to say to them, if you can't do it quickly, put your hand up and ask for help. Can they keep persevering when it gets tricky or they're not sure what to do? Can they communicate their mathematics? So all these things, again, you can access afterwards. I'm not going to read them all to you now, but they're things I would try and look for in my students. And sometimes I would deliberately um, have a list like this in front of me and I would look around the classroom and do some formative assessment to try and um, see how the students are going, but also to help me inform my teaching. Anyway, we've done a lot of ideas here. Uh, and again, I haven't given you too many recipes or, or answers, but we've given you some things to think about as you shape your career. Because in the end, it's up to you. You'll go into your classroom with your students and how you conduct your practice is the thing that will make a difference for those kids. So to me, this sounds like a fun subject to teach. Something much more interesting and exciting and useful and engaging than the dry bones of some of the textbook stuff I had to endure when I was at school. I hope you're finding it uh, interesting too. I hope you, the challenge you're taking it up so when you uh, graduate and when you're on prac, you'll just be the most outstanding maths teachers who have students who just love maths and are looking forward to doing it each time. And I hope through that you'll develop kids who are numerate. Thanks for listening.